Great. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to put my video on so uh, you can put a face to the name. My name is Joshua, um, and I'll be introducing the session today. And very nice to have all of you here. I'm going to give myself a very green background um, for, for the purpose of CVA. Um, and really happy to have everyone here. Uh, please, as I said before, take advantage of the chat box and introduce yourself. Um, where who you are, which country you're dialing in from, so we can get a good understanding of the audience in the room. So really great to have everyone. Um, and I will be just giving an overview of what we'll be doing here today, uh, as well as how the flow of the day would go. And gonna later on pass it over to my colleagues. So this session is focusing on pathways to youth inclusion in local governance. Um, as you would know, um, majority of young people today would live with the consequences of climate change. Um, at the same time, we are asking ourselves, how can young people be part of the engagement uh, in terms of decision making when it comes to climate action, particularly adaptation, because we need to adapt now and adaptation cannot wait. Um, and for that reason, uh, at CBA 14, we already had some conversations around um, finance in adaptation. We had conversations around what young people can do to advance adaptation. And today we really want to focus on how can we really get access to decision-making um, and make sure that we are properly included in decision-making. Uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, the co-host of the event, uh, today's session, Green Africa Youth Organization and Yongo, the official youth constituency of the UNFCCC and the Youth Adaptation Network of the Global Center on Adaptation. Uh, we believe that true inclusion means that young people are not tokenized, their voices are rightfully included, um, at the same time making sure that their inclusion is supported significantly, being it capacity, understanding, knowledge, or whatever. But to do that, we want to take advantage of this event to really hear some of the good practices, experiences, lessons learned, um, and also make sure that we are promoting cooperative action between different sectors and entities when it comes to local governance level. Because while adaptation decisions are taken at the international uh, level in terms of policies and frameworks, we know that adaptation action itself happens locally. And today, together with you and our panelists, we will be working together to define what this could look like. So few housekeeping uh, uh, for us. So if you are not talking as on every virtual uh, uh, meeting now over the past two years when COVID visited us, you know that it's very great if everyone stays muted until you are talking. That is very, very helpful for us. Um, additionally, please, when you have a question that comes to your mind, please feel free to drop the question right in the chat box and we will take care of it and make sure that the speakers um, can address it in due time. So instead of holding your questions back for us to open a Q&A, which might sometimes happen that people forget, just drop your questions, your comments, all in the chat box. And once speakers are done talking, we will provide the opportunity for you to get answers to your questions. So that is how it's gonna go. We, in some few minutes um, or a few seconds, I'm going to open an interactive session where we also hear some feedback from you. Uh, I will uh, mention that we want the session to be as interactive as possible, which means we want to hear from you. So please uh, take advantage when the opportunity comes up that you share your thoughts with us. Later on, there'll be a breakout room um, and the technical side of it for if you've not engaged in a breakout room before is that I'm going to assign you to the rooms um, and afterwards the room will close down and you all come back to this main session with all of us. So please don't leave the, 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 the meeting or the session when you are done with your breakout rooms. The session will not be over yet. You come back to the main room and we'll continue again. Um, so with that, uh, thanks, and I mean, as it works for you, please, um, if you can put your video on, please feel free to do that. If you turn it off and it's better for you, please do that. We try to keep it as comfortable and as feasible, knowing the internet connection and challenges with everyone. 
So uh, let's uh, bear with each other and I hope you're gonna have a very great event together today. Um, so I'm going to open our um, interactive session. And for that, I would need um, all of you, to, for those who have not used um, Mentimeter before, um, I'm going to briefly explain it. But for now, I'm just gonna drop the codes in the chat so that everyone has this. Great, so this is the code and I'm gonna share my screen in a bit so you all have access um, to the, the to the Mentimeter so that you know how we will be doing it. Great. Okay, so here also you get a direct link which you can use uh, to vote. And for now, I will share my screen. So the first question is, if you can see my screen, the first question is, if you can give one word that summarizes your experience working with local government. So please, um, you go to menti.com, uh, type in the code 87158998 and put your answer uh, and we're gonna see it on the screen. So if you've had a chance working with local government before, which means municipalities, um, uh, your districts, um, it could even be really like very small community and working with the representative there. Um, what is your experience working with them? And we can already see some of the responses coming through. So knowledgeable, which is really great. Uh, challenging, frustrating. <laughs> um, so challenging seems to be the big word. Okay. Um, tedious um lengthy okay uh, a lot of conversations before you get to your point i, I guess um <laughs> my interpretation of lengthy okay please keep the answers coming challenging seems to be the main word this is very <laughs> big bureaucracy great oh non existent so in some cases it's not even practical to work with local government interesting all right, there are some positive ones um, I see connected, uh, the knowledgeable capacity building, learning from them. Um, I also see quite some difficult ones, including time consuming. Um, yeah, tedious, great. Uh, we're just gonna keep this going. So please keep coming in with your answers. Um, yeah, so if you are wondering how to join, um just go to menti.com and put the code 87158998 or use the link in the chat to make your input one word that summarizes your experience working with local government okay i don't see any new responses coming in so i will move to the next question um and really thanks for your responses to this because we're going to use this to guide some of the conversation in the breakout rooms as well in terms of how challenging frustrating tedious time consuming it is working together with local government and how to overcome that okay so the next question is this is an open-ended question and what we're trying to understand is if you can describe a little bit uh, of your inclusion in adaptation at the local governance level. And it seems the question is not showing um, on the screen. I'm just gonna stop sharing and reshare again, just to make sure you can see the question. Great. So if you have, if you already went to Menti and you have the code, um, you can already answer to the next question. Um, and that question will be, what 
have been your experience great so i already see some answers coming through i'm going to share my screen so we can all see what the experiences have been so um participatory planning that is very positive okay so someone has the experience of as a consultant with local government uh but <laughs> the person have not be consulted which is very interesting so the possibility of bringing you on board to work with them but not really seeking what your ideas and your inputs are when it comes to adaptation at the local level um it will be great to get more answers coming in um so here we have working with international ngo not directly but with local government um that is also great uh, to see that some people here have already uh worked with local government uh when it comes to youth and inclusion uh, in adaptation planning locally. So great. So we have someone even working on the youth strategy uh, in Ghana. Um, then we have issues like uh, changing minds in terms of adaptation, including inclusion in different fields. So that is a very thorough one, which we can also look at later on. Um, then I really like this because this is also part of my personal experience that local government tend to prioritize their own agenda rather than participatory adaptation process, uh, which is something that uh, as we talk about increasing the space for youth inclusion, we would want to know how do we change this narrative of local government prioritizing themselves. Um, then gender and local adaptation also being uh, part of the inclusion process. Great, so really rich inputs uh, and thanks everyone. Um, and here also last one, I would read this before we move on minimal programming on leadership development uh, for chief executives. Um, this is also very practical, as I know some couple of experiences in Sub-Saharan Africa where the, the leadership of the local government office do not always have the full understanding of uh, climate and environmental issues, which makes it very difficult to engage and work with them. Thanks a lot. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now um, and we would get into sort of getting our speakers to start sharing with us their experiences. Um, so thanks a lot for everyone who participated in this. At the end of the day, we're going to have another mentee uh, questions which we will look at uh, after we've uh, sort of gone into breakout rooms and discussed. So I'll stop sharing my screen now uh, and thanks everyone again. And for now, I would introduce um, our moderator who will take uh, uh, the event forward in the person of Emily Vernal. Um, Emily uh, is currently in the UK and is part of the Youth Adaptation Network and also part of the UNFPA Joint Working Group looking at the nexus of climate adaptation uh, and the work around gender, reproductive health. Um, and she has been vibrant in other many other spaces like the United Nations uh, Major Group for Children and Youth. Emily. Uh, I'll pass it over to you to take us forward with today's event. And thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Josh, for the introduction and for the introduction to the session. And it's my pleasure to support this vitally important um, workshop today at CBA 15 on youth inclusion pathways and local governance. And I'm pleased to be a moderator for this session. So I'd just like to say welcome again to everyone who's joined today. And from the mentee, we can see it's great that we've brought together people with wide ranging experiences of working with local governments with different successes, barriers and access points for young people. And I look forward to the rich inputs and dialogues we'll have in this session and the ensuing breakout sessions in a bit. So it's clear that the world has seen powerful youth led climate and environmental action campaigns spring up all over the world in the last few years, from the grassroots and hyper local to the cross border and cross cultural international movements. But they're all united by the fact that their shared commonality is that they're often driven and sustained by the voices and energy of young people. The generation that would be most affected by the action or indeed the inaction of decision makers, stakeholders and the primary emitters. Young people, however, face many barriers to meaningful youth inclusion in climate governance spaces. Today's session will focus on youth inclusion tracks in local governance and discuss the entry points for youth, the opportunities and barriers for engagement and decision making, planning and the implementation of community based and local action on climate change.
As Josh mentioned, today's session is about hearing and raising the profile of everyone's voices, youth-led action and the best practices that we can all aspire towards. So before I introduce our panellists and speakers for today's session, I would like to briefly introduce the workshop's guiding questions, which will lead and direct our conversations today, both between the speakers and when we go into breakout rooms and we can dive deeper into our personal stories, best practices and experiences. So firstly, we're going to look at what are the key focal areas for youth inclusion in community adaptation processes at the local government level. Secondly, we're going to look at what barriers and enabling factors exist for meaningful youth inclusion, considering the various policies and institutional provisions available. Thirdly, how can young people be supported to gain greater access to decision making spaces, looking at the inclusivity of youth led opportunities? And how do we ensure effective youth inclusion in local adaptation planning and implementation? So I'm now going to introduce our first speaker. We are joined by, by Aldad Akom of the Green Af Africa Youth Organization. Aldad is a project coordinator at Green Africa Youth Organization, which is an organization which works towards youth led gender balanced advocacy and focuses largely on the environmental sustainability and community development. GAO's mission is to interact directly with local communities to reduce the vulnerability of groups that are at risk to climate impact, such as children, youth, and women, who have comparatively less adapted adaptive capacity due to so social and societal inequalities. So Eldad, what are the key focal areas for youth inclusion in community adaptation pro processes at local government level? We'd like to hand the floor over to you to speak first. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, generally, as um, you mentioned, um, Gayo has a lot of work doing within communities. And then before you reach some of these communities, you need to work through the local authorities. And then basically in working through these uh, local authorities, we have two main approach. We work through the local authorities to help develop policy instruments that will also contribute to reducing the vulnerability of groups. And also we work through the local authority to create um, green jobs. And then in Ghana, for instance, we are working within um, the Cape Coast, and then also in New And then um, one of the ways that one of one of the ways that youth inclusion can be can be can be can be seen in some of these engagements is how our projects influence local bylaws on waste management in particular. And then how through our engagements, we are able to, because uh, when you look at the informal waste sector, for instance, we are predominantly um, young people and, then, and, and, and women. So what we do also is to work together with the local communities to formalize and then coordinate the informal waste sector. So, um, I, I hope I've answered. Yeah, hello. Hello, thank you very much, Eldad. Um, perhaps you could share some experiences of the opportunities or perhaps barriers that you've um, noticed people have faced at GAO in terms of trying to involve with lo local community actors and with local governance. Okay, thank you very much. Um, generally, some of the experiences include the bureaucracy within the system. Generally, getting involved with the local government comes with a whole lot of barriers. First of all, getting accepted. You realize that the local governments have strategic plans with which they run their activities. And what we realize is that their plans are not flexible to accommodate um, youth-led adaptation action. So it becomes very difficult to, to, to first get the attention. So on paper, the general idea is that we want young people to be involved, but when you get on the ground, you realize that some of these plans are not flexible to accommodate youth-led action. And then also when, when, when you're able to get through to the top hierarchy approval, Oh, 
Are you still with us, Eldad? Okay, I think we may have lost Eldad for a second. Hopefully he can reconnect. In the meantime, perhaps we could ask the audience if we can start collecting any questions that we may have from you at this point that we can redirect towards Eldad when he joins. So feel free to type any questions into the chat as the speakers are doing their presentations and sharing their best practices, or raise your hand if you have a question that you would like to share in person. And we will give Eldad a second to rejoin unless I am directed to move on to the next panelist. Okay, I think we'll have to come back to Eldad if he can rejoin. So I will now introduce our next speaker. So second to share their experiences of involvement with local um, governance structures and youth involvement in um, community and local governance um, projects is Marie-Claire Graff, who is from Youngo. Marie-Claire is an ambitious climate action and sustainable development activist and a co-founder of several local, national and international initiatives and associations that all focus around empowering children and youth to catalyse positive, meaningful and impactful change. So as Young goes focal point at the UNFCCC, she is working to empower youth to formally bring our voices to the UNFCCC and demand urgent and unprecedented ambitious climate action. And she'll be able to provide a wealth of experience on youth access to decision making processes from the local to the international. So Marie-Claire, please could you um, join us on the floor now to share with us your thoughts and experiences on youth access and entry points to decision making processes and how young people can be better supported to gain greater access to decision making spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for giving me the floor and thank you so much for hosting this conference. Very important to really have a dedicated session for young people where we also feel welcome. And also very important that we actually talk about decision making because we see young people all around the globe on the streets, we see young people leading on implementation, but where we do not see young people so often is in decision making. And it's so important that young people are in decision making because we um, have to ensure that the frameworks, the political decisions are made in a way that actually they're supporting our efforts. And unfortunately, especially on the international level, but also on the national and the local level, well, we mostly see people from another generation. And it's on top of all of this, very, very unattractive for young people to get in. As mentioned in my, in, in my introduction, I am engaged in the United Nations climate change process, but also on the national level um, with the government on the environment, kind of trying to implement this international agenda. And then also on the very local level. And wherever I work with policy, um, you kind of see like the same type of people very often it's like this yeah older guy who is there right talking and abbreviations most young people do not understand it's very um it's very distant and not, and not really yeah kind of engaging and what um i am working on as, as you mentioned i work for for a youth network um called Yango. it's a combination of youth ngos to try to ensure that young people have a safe space where they can express themselves where they feel comfortable to ask the questions where they are, are comfortable to to build networks to then build also the capacity to actually go into these negotiations going to decision making um structures and raise their voices um, and we have been doing this very successfully on an international level now since, I mean, since 30 years, young people are involved officially, formally, we are engaged since 10 years. Um, but now as we have like an international agreement and we have to move to action, right? Um, it's more and more coming down to the national and local level. And what we again see there that very often the structure, decision-making structures are kind of very ex exclusive. But what we now can build on is this international network where, of course, young people from over 180 countries are part of, that they are building also national structures of young people um, and building this intersection with the national poli policy makers because we have been already engaging with them, right? Um, and now that we are, for example, in the national implementation, it's around the national determined contribution when it comes to the to adaptation, it's about the national adaptation plans, the NAPs. Um, these are all international process, but now we have to localize them. And we have already been 
there have already been young people engaging with them. And now I think it's important that these young people are getting more young people around that we actually can build a network of young practitioners who have an understanding of the policy space and of the policy and the decision making space and that they can support young people to get into this. And I really hope that we can also advance on the, on the national climate action plans. They are now getting implemented. They are now getting worked on that we can have even more youth consultation so young people are not only the ones who are executing the plans, but actually are in the are looped in the whole policy cycle and bring in their very valuable experience from the ground, from the fields, um, from the forest or wherever they are working on an adaptation um, so that we can ensure that the frameworks, the political frameworks are done in a way that it's actually really truly benefiting the young people and also the, the funding coming along. I think it's very, very crucial um, that young people have access, sufficient access to funding for implementing their projects. Thank you very much, Marie Claire. That was honestly some fantastic insights into your experience and also the barriers and opportunities that young people are facing all over the world through your, that you've seen through your networks. Um, we're now going to open the floor to some questions for yourself. I would like to start with a question picking up on an important point that you just said about how it's been very clear in the last few years that young people are energised and they're leading in these youth-led movements, yet there still seems to be this barrier moving from youth-led movements and youth-led NGOs into meaningful intergenerational decision-making positions where the youth have a voice which is both engaging and not tokenistic and I wondered if you could share any best practices or what you believe needs to be in place for youth to move from these youth-led organizations to youth in local decision-making positions? Yeah, absolutely. Very, very relevant question. And what we can do um, is that we are reaching out to the governments because very often they it doesn't occur to them that actually they could reach out to us. Very often they do not think about having, for example, someone young in the team. They do not think that having maybe a youth advisory board or giving at least one seat to a young person um, so I think it really needs to start with us because we do we, we do, do not have the time until maybe in five years they maybe it occurs to them that maybe they could have a young person on board. So I think it really needs to come from our side that we are reaching out that we are also a credible source. So of course, like we have to try to understand the spaces and where we can come in. And it's also like where Youngo is very happy to help as a network of, of extensive experience. Um, but also where you find young people who have been do doing this on the ground. So I think it's very important to be proactive and reaching out. I know it is not easy for many young people in many countries around the world, or maybe it's like a very um, traditional old fashioned system. Nevertheless, I, I would really love to encourage young people to, to feel empowered to do so. Um, and also like, yeah, ask for, for support from young people, because this is, I think the quickest way how we can ensure that we have youth voices represented, um, but also uh, to, to work on, um, on, on like local projects, but try to bring them or like, um, for example, when you do adaptation projects, try to ensure that the project is not only done in a way um, like, okay, this is the youth project it's somewhere out there, but if there is a national big project that they have a youth um, voice like directly included so that you can maybe like either link your work to, an, to a bigger national project, or you can ensure when a bigger project is, is implemented that um, we, can, we can bring in um, yeah, young people in, into this. Um, so I think it's important that we are that we are proactive because we have I think that we have kind of we are told like okay young people you have to wait um, you you are not the ones who are leading on a discussion and I think we have to get out of this sometimes a little bit uh, reactive position into a proactive um, position when it comes to decision making and also like be clear we do not know everything this is fine because also the older generation they do not know everything but really point out the value what young people can bring to the table we are like very often the ones who are very well educated because we're just coming from university we have the access to the best available science um, very often we are like digitally like digital natives or like very close to digital tools we have access to innovation we have we have a lot of access also to, to a global network of young people for example through Youngo we should make use of them because actually like very often this is what is lacking in the older generations um, and uh, like really pointing out these strengths and hopefully this will convince them and also please do not give up it's very hard I have been myself in these spaces for a very long time and it's very easy to get frustrated and drop out but please stay in um, and there will be like after this this valley of death or whatever we want to call it of frustration it will go up and if you understand the space if you have your network I can I really believe it's a very, very important and valuable um, space to be in 
but it's frustrating. It's it takes a long time. It's it's not the most attractive. Also, when you tell tell to your friends, like you're in some decision making structure, they're not, probably not going to be like so. Oh my god, this is awesome. Um, but it's it's truly important. So please um stick around, even if it's maybe not the easiest task. Sorry, I was on mute there. And thank you very much, Rita. Um, just looking at the questions we're getting in the chat, um, there's quite a lot of questions that are on um, more vulnerable communities or inclusion based upon perhaps gender or ethnicity, and how perhaps can we encourage youth from the front lines of climate change or in more marginalised communities to get involved where perhaps access to these structures or these networks isn't as readily available, and whether or not young go have any best practices they can share in terms of inclusion and diversity. Absolutely, very important question. I, maybe something I didn't yet say is that young people, we, we are half of the world's population. So we are not like a one homogeneous group and all the young people want the same. Many of us uh, were, were, were fighting for, for against the climate crisis. We want to have ambitious action, but even like how this ambitious action looks like is very different from, from the different backgrounds and countries. So it's very important to younger that we have a truly inclusive network. Um, as mentioned, we have young people from over 180 countries, but even then, I mean, just having people from different countries doesn't make it inclusive. And yes, we have to get better. We have to reach out in local languages to even more young people. The UN um, is very often in, in English. Um, that's why we also, for example, adapted our global conference of youth into local conference of youth. So everyone can kind of take the concept and organize a local conference of youth in the language they desire. So it can be Spanish, French, um, Italian, uh, Russian, Chinese, but it can also be a, a local language only spoken by let's say an indigenous tribe, and they can then submit their outcome document, which then need of course be translated into one of the UN languages. And then we can integrate this in the global, um, in the global uh, declaration or in the global, um, the global report. So we can hopefully try to ensure to reach these people even better. Um, on the other hand, I think it's very important for us to be mindful when we have the opportunity to speak on this high level panel that we are representing so many different voices and also clearly point out um, the struggles of the people who are living on the front line. For many of them, it's already now, or it was already in the past about life and death. And there are so many young people who already have been seriously affected by the climate crisis. It's not something we are like in the future at one point, it's, go it's, go it's coming, right? Um, and I think this is very important. We do um, have, for example, a gender working group within Yango. We have an indigenous working group within Yango. We work very um, closely together with other groups um, who, are, who are working on this. And we're also truly interested in becoming better, right? I mean, we are not yet perfect. And if you have any ideas on, on how we can even be more inclusive and transparent, um, yeah, we would love to learn from you and also engage with you further. Thank you very much. I think that's such an important point. The youth are not a monolithic or homogenous group, and we must recognise that when when there are youth inclusion tracks and youth inclusion pathways at any local governments or international government structure and process, that we must remember that this is representing multiple and perhaps diverse and differing opinions, viewpoints and experiences on climate change and climate change adaptation. And um, we will have a chance to dive into greater questions with Marie Claire when we go into our breakout rooms. She will be in one of the breakout rooms and we can continue to share um, questions and best practices and hear from the audience. But first, um, we are going to hear from a speaker at VSO. Um, so, Sherry, say if you're there, um, would you like to take the floor and share on your experiences of um, youth inclusion in local governance. Thank you very much. Uh, namaste everyone, I'm Shreya Chetri uh, from VSO. I'm Media and Communication National Volunteer there. Uh, so in VSO, we have been uh, in VSO, we have been um, uh, we have been uh, we have been uh, um, conducting uh, um, a, a project, PRAYAS, which is promoting, uh, promoting inclusive resilience and accountability through youth association strengthening. Um, and uh, it works with, it works by promoting inclusive resilience, uh, inc inclusive resilience uh, and it aims to strengthen the role of youth-led uh, CSOs to effectively engage youth and other marginalized group in local climate and disaster resilience processes in Nepal's uh, federal context. Right now, uh, we have been 
working with 15 youth-led organizations from uh, youth-led organizations from two districts in Nepal. And our aim is to empower at least 10, uh, at least 1,000 youths to promote peer-to-peer -peer participation in local CDR process through CDR capacity development, advocacy, and social accountability approaches. Uh, we have been um, the the youth who over there, the youth uh, youth over there have been capacitated, uh, engaging them in uh, co community scorecard to review the youth responsiveness in their uh, civil society organization, the organization that they have been working in, um, and um, basically. Civil society, uh, the civil society organization, they exercised the community scorecard, which is an accountability approach where the quality of provided services are scored. Um, they engage the local community people, at least um, the local community people, and scored the services provided by their community uh, civil by their civil society organization discussed individual indicators to assess their current status on youth responsiveness and internal good governance. Um, they developed an action plan and are in the state of implementing those plans. Some of the while uh, some of the youth led uh, civil society organizations have also uh, are also in the process of revising their organizational policies according to the uh, according to the results from the um, commu from the com community scorecard. Um, the youth in the district, the youth in the target districts, have also been engaging local experts, local community, and local government for risk assessment uh, and uh, resilience. Another vital role that they have played uh, is making a rapport between the youth of the community and uh, and the vulnerable segment of the community with the government and making them aware about the government plans and policies for the implementation of resilience action plan. They've also been advocating um, about allocating more fund for to build the community resilience, build community resilience, um, as the resilience in the um, local government budget. So um, one of the major, um, major areas that have been focused by Prayas uh, from VSO is partnership of the youth with the local government, uh, social accountability activities to sensitize the um, duty bearers. The local government have also been um, conducted and um, so that the duty bearers become more accountable for inclusive and responsive approaches. This has resulted in commitment from the local government uh, for public hearing. And one of the district has also uh, um, has already conducted a public hearing because of this, uh, the, because of the activities that have been conducted by the local youth. So the the local youth and the government have also been participating and engaging in um, vulnerability capacity assessment in preparation of youth friendly resilience action plan and meeting those in the yearly budget of the local um, local government, advocacy to implement government plans and policy through uh, dialogues and meetings and works uh, workshops, with, with the engagement of the local youth has also been encouraged there. Um, so the youth community and um, school and vulnerable segment of the uh, society have been made aware of all of these government plans that they have been uh, trying to implement in the resilience uh, resilience action about um, resilience action plan. Um, yeah, so. Um, uh, these are the things that have been done, and as a result, uh, uh, there is a local disaster and climate uh, uh, challenge resilience action plan that has been in preparation. On the preparation is ongoing, and fifteen youth-led uh, civil society organization have been trained in governance and local disaster and climate resilience processes. Uh, so, um, yeah, the provincial and municipal line agency officials have also been trained in youth responsive climate and disaster 
uh, resilience processes, and they have been uh, the and the youth have been youth um, of youth representatives of the youth led civil society organizations have been oriented in social audit uh, to um, for the local representation um, to promote good governance and social accountability. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Riyathi. Uh, that was a really interesting um, outline of particularly the best practices and the successes you've had of youth inclusion in local governance processes. It was really interesting to hear the way that youth are involved in the accountability and evaluation process, the way that a lot of the resilience action plans have been made youth centric and specifically include inclusory of um, the youth-led civil society organisations and also the way that youth have been included in the training and capacity building on resilience and disaster measures. So that was really, really um, insightful. Thank you very much for sharing. We would like to just ask all of the audience again if you have any final questions um, to put towards either Shriasi or Aldad, who I believe has been able to rejoin the conversation before we go into our breakout room. So feel free to post your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function if you would like to to share any further questions before we go to our breakout rooms. Well, as it looks like we, we do not have any further questions, I will hand over to Josh again, and I believe he will be putting us into our breakout rooms where we'll be able to dive deeper into these questions and all have the opportunity to share our best practices and our experience of youth inclusion in um, local governance structures. So over to you, Josh, thank you very much. Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, so we're gonna get into breakout rooms and thanks to all the speakers for the insights. Um, yeah, Eldad's experience on facing the bureaucracy at the local government level uh, and the uh, unwillingness to listen to young people particularly, uh, plus what he said about um, the, the local government not necessarily ready to accept views of young people or even work together with young people because of how they are structured. And to Marie Claire's um, taking it from the global perspective in terms of decision making and bringing it down to uh, what her experience is working with youth um, and sort of the heterogeneous nature of youth, sort of youth not being one big group, but also groups of different uh, um, needs and, and, and demands. Uh, that is very essential. And also with the experience and accountability uh, uh, in, in Nepal. So we will get into breakout rooms and in the breakout rooms, what we will try to do is still explore these questions further and pick up on what the speaker said um, and also really give the chance for, um, I was looking at the chat and also realizing that uh, the audience have their own experiences as participants of this event, have your own experiences around these topics and to really bring your experiences to what the speakers have said so that we can really map out what will be the best way to overcome some of these challenges and how to answer these questions um, with the session ultimately wants to answer at the end of the day. So you, your screen is gonna pop up, uh, you're gonna be assigned into a room. Uh, and uh, as I said before, please, um, after, the, after you're done with the breakout room, do not leave the meeting completely, come back to the main plenary um, so that we can wrap up before you leave the event. So we hope to have all of you back uh, at the end of the day. So um, in a click, you should your screen should open um, and you have facilitators for the breakout room. So uh, Lisa, uh, who is from Kenya uh, and also part of the Youth Adaptation Network and, and Yongo will be moderating the room with Marie Claire. Uh, and Emily together with Eldad uh, would also moderate um, a second room, which would also get the chance to hear from all of you. And particularly another case study from uh, Burundi um, in that room from Louis second Mugisha. So I'm gonna open the rooms now um, and see you all back in the plenary soon. So please uh, accept to join the room um, and see you in a bit, thanks. 
Thank you very much. So now um, the moderators of each group are going to share a summary of what was discussed um, and we'll be able to look at the commonalities and the synergies between between the best practices and barriers and opportunities that were discussed and and kind of draw some conclusions on youth inclusion pathways in local governance. Um, we had a few internet issues in in my breakout room. Actually, no, I was breakout room two. So we'll go first to breakout room one. Um, I believe Lisa was um, moderating this. Lisa, can you hear me? And confirm yes. if that was the case? Yes, yes, I was there. Uh, please um, feel free to share your um, summary of the group. Okay, sure. So uh, basically, the, uh, we uh, Marie Claire highlighted the bit of youth being strategic, and uh, we need to encourage each other because it's it's not an easy space to be. Mostly when we need to be included in the decision making processes, but we shouldn't give up and we should support each other. And there was a question. Uh, there was a a story, a capacity, uh, a, a successful story regarding youth in, uh, involvement with the government from Rohit from Nepal, whereby he shared how how they are training their youths and um, by to make uh, they are training their youth to be aggressive and empowering them and uh, giving them the necessary skills that they need to uh, work with the government and th their story is successful because they are they are holding even uh, training schedules with the government to keep them accountable of what they have said they need to deliver so i consider that that is an encouragement story for the rest of us because and the bit that we need to work together and support each other and have one voice as we approach these government institutions and representatives. And also uh, they even build dialogues and assessment progresses with the government institu institutions. Basically, it's a successful story. It, is, it has shown us that it is possible for us to have a space whereby we can have conversations and be on board in the decision-making processes, the adaptation um, processes. And also there was uh, two questions. One question was regarding someone was asking uh, if they are a startup, how do they get funding? And uh, Marie Claire responded by telling them that they are being in the younger space uh, gives the, us opportunities where we can get different funding. They are finding opportunities out there, but many young people do not have access to them. So through young, you're able to get these opportunities that, yeah, you can access funding. And also at the country, at the national level, we have the NAPs. So you can approach the government whereby you can reach out to them and be persistent if you need funding for a project you are executing. And also connecting with NGOs uh, whereby uh, they have funding knowledge and how to get a grant so you can decide to have a build a branch of the NGO and uh, have a local team which can assist the NGO in implementing the objective. And then there was also a question regarding how youths are not homogeneous. So how do we how do we deal with that diversity and uh, the solution was we reach out to them and talk to them and try to explain to them the to, to explain to, we just reach out to them and communicate to them the message and uh and also yeah that's it basically what we got from our breakout we didn't manage to finish we needed to come back here yeah but it was an interesting session Back to you, Emily. Back to you, Emily. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, unfortunately, due to internet issues, we did not manage to hear from Aldad or from Louis in our room. Um, oh yeah, Louis got his hand raised, so I will just, um, if he if he is able to quickly share something now, as he was not able to before. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do you get me? Hello. Hello. We can hear. Hello. We can hear. 
Okay. I am Luis Ogomugisha, as he has been said. I am from Burundi, a country which is located in East Africa. I am in status of in Burundi during this conference, which place working with the program of in these last days, mainly in April, there has been the blazing waters of Lake Tanganyika, which resulted in the flooding where people lost their properties, such as houses, home materials, farms, etc. Due to that, people from Gatunga and Kajaga were obliged to move from those areas to other places which are far from the lake. And around uh, 50,000 people were affected according to OEM. The document is available. Uh, you can search on internet and then you can get it. And the main causes are uh, no compliance with statistical standards allowed to occupy surfaces which are dangerous for human beings, citizens who, who are not mobilized on the problems which could endanger their life in occupying those dangerous places. Also due to the pollution caused by industries and surrounding mountains, we are aware the water from rivers uh, that surround the lake goes immediately in the lake. Uh, they go immediately in the lake because there are, uh, there are few trees on those mountains. Uh, we should note that uh, Lake Tanganyika is the deepest lake after Lake Baikal, which is the first in the world. Uh, that is, Tanganyika is the second uh, lake which is deeper uh, after Baikal. Uh, Tanganyika Lake also is, is the lake which has a fresh water that you can wash and drink without effect. Also, it is the first one which has a diversity of species that you cannot find as well in the world. We can understand by that, that it is an international property that should be protected. As an activist on the ground, we have, we, I have fear of serious problems that would arise when a thing continues or uh, as they are. Even victims are being helped in providing some materials for their location, it is not enough, and I would suggest this. People should be sensitized on the problems that could endanger their lives in respecting the norms fixed by the government, training on some effects that could arise by organizing conferences and teaching in the community on how the environment should be protected by calling their attention. Also, leaders should be careful and be the first one to take into account that issue by fixing measures to be respected in preventing problems in advance. As an activist on the ground, we have a hope that things will change due to the information people are getting and due to strategies which are being used in order to prevent those problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Um, I will just very briefly um, share my contribution from the second breakout room, um, but we're short on time, so I'll just keep it brief and then hand back to Josh. So um, similar to um, some of the synergies and discussions that Lisa's um, group had in breakout room one, we, despite the fact that we had contributions from Bangladesh, from Cameroon, from the Middle East, from the Philippines, um, one of the key things that came out in terms of barriers was capacity building and knowledge and the importance of investing both time and financing into capacity building for young people, particularly on disaster response and resilience and how this can feed into their ability to contribute to local governance. 
Um, particularly on the example we had from Bangladesh, we had a success story of the um, impact of successful youth capacity building and training exercises and the way that this brought about inclusive and gender balanced um, groups of young individuals who were able, able to overcome generational cultural barriers to gender inclusivity and engagement at the local level, which was a really interesting um, and positive success story. Um, another key barrier we had was age and the way that age is often a marker of respect in cultures all over the world. This came up from multiple geographical contexts. Um, and we looked at the way that that meant that sometimes it can be harder for young people to meaningfully engage if, if they are not supposed to culturally raise their voice and have, have their opinion voiced in, in circles where, where age is a matter of respect and younger people are not supposed to have their voices heard. Um, we had a very good example from um, Syria, though, where the Syrian crisis um, perhaps brought about new opportunities in young people raising their voice as the crisis um, allowed um, some cultural norms to be subverted and for young people to have more of a voice and more respect in terms of their voice as a result of the crisis. And perhaps we can see that in places which are on the front lines of climate change too, in humanitarian crises. And we also had a very good example um, of a barrier from the Philippines in which many of the youth councils are often delegated topics that are considered suitable for young people or considered more fun, but they're not given the serious topics. So again, we're seeing that there are youth engagement um, structures in place, but often they're tokenistic or re reduc reduced to what um, young people are supposed to be knowledgeable on. So I guess there were questions raised about um, and people not valuing young people's expertise. Um, we also had a lot of success stories in terms of the ability of young people to galvanise and rally together and um, the success of training when it was invested in. Um, and like Lisa said, we didn't have time to hear from everyone and I'm sure there were even more fantastic contributions and I hope we can keep these conversations and dialogues going offline after the session. Um, and I'll pass back over to Josh, thank you very much. Thank you, Emily, and thanks everyone. I've been trying to make notes and sharing my screen so everyone can see uh, what we got out of the breakout rooms. Um, thanks a lot to the speakers uh, for sharing these insights with us from the work you do. Um, and just some few things to wrap up the session, which I find very, very interesting is one of the points that came out really looking at windows of opportunities during crisis uh, and using that as, as a moment to really enhance the voice of young people in policy uh, at the local government level. And I, I know that this works because in those moments, there has to be action, there has to be mobilization, and it's really a lesser time to look at gender or cultural or age, those barriers. It's really moments where everyone wants to focus on how do we move forward and really encouraging um, sort of seeing this as a solution, as a way of increasing spaces. Um, the issue of funding is uh, very important and um, uh, great to hear sort of Yongo's um, uh, experience of mobilizing finance for youth startups. Um, also uh, mentioning that the Youth Adaptation Network at the G Global Center on Adaptation is also looking at launching a youth adaptation fund uh, or a solutions challenge, which will be launched in September. Um, so something to keep your eyes on. Um, and there are a couple more finance for youth uh, uh, programs that have been uh, that are coming up these days still very smaller tickets not a uh, big funding that you can actually sort of um, do really a lot of projects with um, and we still need more of that so something for us to rally on um, and really I cannot sort of uh, express the the excitement to see the point on investing time and finance uh, into capacity building for response at the local government level, knowing that um, this is CBA and most of the people here and the, the communities we work with are dealing with sort of climate hazards on everyday basis. And if you want to really enhance uh, community-based adaptation and local aided action, this is essential. So thanks everyone, really helpful uh, uh, for us uh, from Yongo side, from Green Africa Youth Organization, and the Youth Adaptation Network. And, and I hope everyone here, uh, these are very good points for us to take back to the work we do and try to expand on these. Uh, to really conclude the session, I'm just gonna open the Mentimeter again. 
uh, and, and one more time, uh, you can scan this QR code uh, or go to menti.com and use the code 8715. Uh, and then I will share my screen again for one final question and then we can wrap up. So the, the question we want to ask to finish the conversation today is uh, for you to share with us uh, sort of one word that summarizes your key lessons from this uh, session. And I think people already started <laughs> answering before I got here. Uh, so here we go. One word that describes your lessons from this uh, session. Um, and we already have motivating, informative, adaptable. Um, please uh, go ahead, get to menti.com, use the code 87158998 um, and bring that forward. When I see the word aggressiveness, I'm not so sure what that really means <laughs> and to what extent uh, the aggressiveness of young people should go and what part of that keeps us safe. And maybe in CBA 16, we would want to look at uh, security and safety of young activists uh, uh, at community level when they do the activism. <laughs> uh, but really good to see that as well. Um, unity, inspiring encouragement. Uh, please keep your inputs coming um, because uh, it will be great to get this word cloud as a summary of this session, something we can always look at to see what we got out of the youth inclusion track at CBA 15. So uh, please go to menti.com and use the code uh, to bring your answers to this uh, web cloud. I'm going to allow folks to be able to, to join and bring your join and bring your Great. So more are coming in. I see unity, strong in diversity, awesome. Common experiences, that is great. Please keep it coming. And I hope you all have the, you can all access menti.com. And while I await people to come and I see a question to me from Dan Robin um, on the, if there's already info on the Youth Adaptation Fund. Uh, there is nothing public yet, uh, but once there is something, uh, I'm gonna make sure to circulate it through the the uh, uh, the participant list for, for CBA 15, particularly on youth, so that uh, you have access to it. So uh, I would do well to circulate that. And I think that there are a couple of uh, funding that are already out, which are youth led. And I will try to circulate that via email to everyone who registered for this session as well. Uh, because I think there are three different funds that are out um, for youth, particularly youth focused. Uh, small tickets, but very useful for community work. So I will circulate that around. And I think we should all also work together in creating more of such funds within our institutions and, and organizations and our, the donors we work with to create more funds, which are very, very targeted uh, for, for young people. Great. So I think I like what I see now with the word cloud. Encouragement being one big word in the middle um, with more inputs coming in. Thanks a lot, everyone. It was really nice having this session together with all of you. Uh, our time is up. Uh, I mean, we are still, um, I think, some a minute or two, uh, two over the time. But thanks a lot. And really looking forward to having you in tomorrow's session, which will be the Youth Policy Jam. Uh, and that will focus mainly on COP26, which will happen uh, in Glasgow this year and looking at 26 years of COP, what has been achieved, what is the aspiration of young people when they think about COP, uh, and what does this mean for community work? So if you think of this global climate conversation, knowing that adaptation and resilience is a big part of COP26 and the advocacy towards uh, at COP26, what does this mean for community work? So please do well to join that session. Uh, it will be tomorrow, same time, uh, as today's meeting, uh, and it will be led by VSO together with Gayo, uh, the Youth Adaptation Network, and Yongo as well, who is very strong in the engagement at the UNFCCC. Thanks, everyone, uh, and Thank look looking forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>